Hey guys, welcome to episode 24 of the Gecko Pod. We are a podcast for the Gecko community where we talk about the hobby and business of breeding geckos. And our hope is to learn from each other as breeders uh, to continue to further the development of this hobby, to get more and more people excited uh, for this hobby, uh, for the projects, and to continue to bring more people into not just the gecko hobby, but reptile hobby in general, uh, so that we can all just uh, continue to grow and have a good time. And um, so th uh, today, um, we are missing AJ. My name is Harry from Zero's Geckos. Um, I am a new breeder, my second year in, second season in, and I'm still in the ramp up, build up phase. And so I'm still learning, to, trying to be patient with everything. AJ is my co-host and we've uh, become good friends uh, throughout the past year. He's one of the OGs in the hobby. He's absent this week. He couldn't make it. Sorry about that, Jordan. <laughs> but um, he's going to be at... my fault. No, 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 not at all. But he'll be at Tinley um, this this weekend. Uh, I know a bunch of you guys are going to Tinley. And so go say hi to AJ. Give him a hard time uh, this weekend. And today we have our friend Jordan from Ruby's Reptiles joining us. Uh, Jordan, how are you doing, man? How's it going? Good. Good. How are you? I'm good, man. Everything is going well. Um Who's that on? Who's that on your shoulder? Who's that? <laughs> Tell us about this. This bearded. This is my boy Knox. Um, he's also the one that's on the logo of our T-shirt. Yeah. Essentially, he's just a crazy red bearded dragon. That's awesome. Is he one of your uh, first um, males? Yeah. So he's essentially like my goal for the entire project was just to produce some of the like best structured, darkest red animals that I could. Um, yeah. There's a lot of reds on the market that are. <laughs> not the best genetically speaking um or they have like a lot of structural problems and so we kind of picked you know the best stuff we could find and bred it and he was one of my best holdbacks that i've grown out and now thankfully i've got children of his that i've been growing out and nice the man. generation nice. gets to continue yeah yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about your beard is just to see how it compares to like the gecko world but um so i you know i was confused i i, I saw you I think i saw you at uh at tinley the october tinley um mm -hmm. and i wasn't sure uh what how you look like just like a lot of breeders i don't know what they look, look like um, yeah i don't i don't have my face on a lot of like social media <laughs> yeah. stuff i try to kind of make the animals like the emphasis yeah and i'm a little camera yeah. shy so yeah but it does help now that we know now that people know what who you look like uh how you look exactly. like they're gonna see you at the <laughs> see at the shows and whatnot but um how come you're ruby's reptiles why aren't you jordan's reptiles who's uh so Ruby originally was more just kind of like the general theme for color. Um, okay. Initially, when oh, we it. started out, red dragons were like my thing. Um, yeah, it was really all I was buying. It was all I was trying to kind of I was going around to different breeders and just European breeders, Asian breeders, like different US breeders and just trying to find like the best red dragons that I could find essentially. And Ruby kind of just encompasses like the overall color that we're trying oh, got to it. kind of portray okay. on the animal. Got it. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So I was like, oh, rubies. It's not rubies. It's just ruby reptiles. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone for the longest time thought my name was Ruby. And they're like, why is your name? Your name's Jordan. Yeah. yeah, why, yeah. why are you, you Ruby? Yeah. I'm like, I, the color, man. Yeah. No, no, that's funny because I thought it's rubies, but it's not rubies. It's uh, ruby reptiles. So that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good clarification um, on the name. So, were you, uh, you're from Phoenix. We were talking a little bit earlier. You're from Phoenix. Were you born and raised there or are you from somewhere else originally? Born and raised. Been here my entire okay. life. Um, okay. Grew up in a few different areas right around Phoenix, but I've been pretty much in Phoenix since yeah. the beginning. So your home is also your facility as well. You, you have like yeah. an office space. Yeah. So we have a, a couple different rooms in the house. Thankfully, we've got one room that's just dedicated to the dragons. Um, it gets a lot hotter okay. in there and they don't yeah. like humidity. So kind of uh, the opposite of what the geckos want. And I guess then, that's perfect for the desert then. I mean, you're so yeah. hu um, so dry there. So the so bears don't need any humidity. So they need some to a degree. Um, super, super low humidity can cause shedding problems, but at the okay. same time, okay. they're really prone to getting respiratory infections if you have yeah. not enough ventilation and your humidity is too high. So having kind of lower humidity helps prevent a lot of like respiratory issues. Yeah. Um, but we have to keep like a bunch of fans in the room and all the tanks are super well ventilated just so air is constantly circulating in there because okay. yeah. putting an animal in a box and then you know, closing it so there's yeah, no yeah, air yeah. circulation after a certain amount of time is just going to cause problems if you're not set up properly. Yeah. No, I got you. And you started, when did you start? Did you start with bearded? That was your first thing that you uh, broke into the reptile hobby with? Absolutely. Um, bearded dragons were kind of like my 
favorite pet growing up. It was yeah. something I always wanted. My parents were like, nope, sorry, you can have a hamster. <laughs> like, well, it's it's not a reptile, but you know we're close. We'll we'll take care of it and, and make the best of what we got. But when I went off to college, I I wanted to get a dorm pet, so I bought a beardy, and this was about ten years ago now. And oddly enough, mm. I still have that same animal that I had in my dorm. She's a grandma at this point. She's ancient, but <laughs> that that was where we started, and uh, like it kind of just. Old. Yeah, we progressively kind of built up to where, hey, now we've got a bunch of different morphs. Hey, now we're wow. getting, you know, breeding plans. And yeah. in like 2018, 2019, I stumbled across, it was probably like an ad of some sorts, but it was an Altitude Exotics video on YouTube. <laughs> I was yeah. like, hey, that's not a bearded dragon. That's that's really cool. What what are these? And you go down, I'm sure you know, the rabbit <laughs> hole. Of, I went down oh my the rabbit God. hole wow, with the blood button these... videos. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. And then you go on Morph Market and you click on Crested Geckos. And like for a bearded dragon guy, it's like clicking ball pythons. Like you see all the yeah. morphs and you're like, oh yeah, my gosh. You get lost. I'm... Yeah. Where do I even begin? Yeah. Yeah. That That's interesting. Oh, so 20, so you've, you've been breeding bearded for quite a while. Bearded, I started breeding in 2017. That was when I had okay. like my first official pair that I was kind of going into. Um, and geckos, how, yeah, about 2019, 2020. Okay, so you got the bearded, and eventually you, you transitioned into the geckos. Did you do crested geckos? I know you have garg gargs too, right? And some mm -hmm. nuchies. So, yeah, so I have a lot of cresteds. That's kind of like the the bulk of my thing. I have, I want to say about 40 pairs. Um, in yeah. terms of babies, probably about 200 right now lychees wow. i only have one i did get four with intentions of breeding but yeah. they're just too similar to bearded dragons for me they're like <laughs> gecko versions of bearded dragons in terms yeah, of like yeah. how much they poop and yeah, one yeah. thing that was really appealing to me <clears throat> as a dragon person is like dragons these guys are eating machines but they're yeah. also pooping machines these guys as babies will poop like three four times a day oh, adult size poops are literally lychee poops so you get a lychee and it's all cute and little at first and then when <laughs> yeah. it hits 350 grams you're like wow this is no different this one is just yeah. it doesn't like heat yeah oh that's interesting so i mean and the beard is take do they take quite a bit of space in terms yeah. of the yeah so thing? all of my yeah. uh, tanks that i keep the adults in and babies too are pretty much all like four by two by twos uh okay wow yeah so yeah, crested so... must be a nice change up in terms of the space saving <laughs> it's really nice because you can't do this with bearded dragons to any yeah. degree. And bearded yeah. dragons are super like cannibalistic too if if they're not fed oh. properly and housed properly. Okay. So it's yeah. a completely different ball game. That's interesting. So it's is it so it's significantly harder to take care of bearded or are they still okay. Crescents are like much more work. Yeah. I see. I see. Well, do you feel like you would uh continue to expand bearded or, or I've kind of reached I've kind of reached my peak on that one. Um, okay. there, there's a certain, I hit a certain number where it was <laughs> like, you want to obviously make sure that your quality stays at a certain point and yeah. your care stays at a certain point. You know yeah. what I mean? If, yeah. if at any point in time you see either of those are going down, your workload's too much. Yeah. And I yeah. kind of built up to a certain point where it's like, all right, I'm seeing a few more nips and babies than I'd like. Mm. You know, I never used to have this problem. And it's just, you have so many yeah. animals that it's like, I can't take the time to, house each one individually when you have 200 babies you know what i mean you have yeah, to keep yeah. them in groups and <laughs> if the groups aren't a certain size in a certain container they start trying to catch bugs off of each other's tails and that's when yep. accidents happen and things like that so we hit a number and we realized okay this that's not the number <laughs> we want to be at and i downsized about a third and now we're at a perfect point to where it's like yeah. super manageable last season we managed to go almost the entire season without any nips which was wow. like my goal essentially for the season yeah. and we pretty much yeah. hit it yeah in terms of like geckos and also the bearded you you kind of kind of dial things down into a, a good level right yeah yeah the okay. geckos i haven't really hit a point where i feel like it's it's too much work Okay. The, okay. the dragons with the like amount of cleanup that's required and yeah, care for like breeding and maintenance and females that are egg laying, you have to make sure you're giving them baths. They yeah. also have to eat salad in addition to bugs. It's not quite like wow. uh, ge geckos where you can just put, you know, a little Pangea in there and like, oh, it's good. We'll, we'll check on it in two days. <laughs> yeah. No, if the dragons aren't tended yeah. to like, you know, a couple times a day, there's, there's going to be something wrong. Wow. That's crazy. Do you do it full time? The, the animals you have enough you do you have other work as well right i do i have wow. another full-time business um my fiance and i have we started that okay. up a few years ago that's definitely Is it animal our... related no okay, okay. 
Um, the animals were always just a passion that, you know, I kind of said, as long as it pays for itself, I'm content yeah. with. Obviously, yeah. if anything extra comes out of it, you know, that's, that's awesome. a blessing. I'm not going to be upset with it. But yeah, as long as I can continue to expand and have fun with it <laughs> and just enjoy it. At a certain point, I think if it becomes too much work, it'll kind of suck the life out of you yeah. know what you're doing. Yep, for sure. And so for your collection breakdown, do you have, is it like half beardeds and half uh, geckos or a lot more beardeds to, to geckos or what's the kind of breakdown for your collection? It's, it's a little different with dragons because dragons, you don't want to grow out all your babies is I, I, I wish I could, but no by, exactly by, yeah. they grow so fast that by about eight to 10 weeks, you need to start getting rid of them or you're going to very quickly have wow. like a problem on your hands. So yeah. we have different, you know, wholesale channels and we okay. post some up and morph market and all of that good stuff. But we do have like a determined age that we, you can tell at a certain age, all right, this animal is going to be amazing. I want to keep this. And usually if we have a clutch of like 20, 25 yeah. babies, it's like one or two of those, you know, you pick for structure first, color second. And as long as, you know, both of those kind of meet the criteria, you decide to grow it out and keep it a year or two and mm. take it from there. But there's a lot of animals too, that you keep and you grow out and 18 months in, you're like, all right, well, you got a droopy eye and crinkle toes, which is like <laughs> a little crooked toe on the back foot yeah. essentially, but it can be genetic. And mm. you're like, all right, well, you're cut from the program. Thanks for hanging out <laughs> with us for a year and a half. You're going to go trying. be an amazing <laughs> pet for someone. Yeah, I see. So in, in terms of like the, uh, do you find that the, the Cresteds are similar in how you operate um, the holdbacks and the the time it takes to continually move them is it very systematic just like the bear did uh, the dragons it's systematic but the timeline is significantly different um with these okay. guys i don't like to sell babies there are so many oh, babies okay. that i hatch out of eggs i feel like and you see them right out of the egg and you're like eh, that's that's nothing special yeah and then, and then you'll then be in the middle of feeding like three four months later and you're like whoa when did that pop out yeah i need I guess... to keep this and keep an yeah. eye on it because <laughs> this is crazy at, at what weight do you feel like that's important for cresteds, according to your your uh, experience? I, I would say by like five grams is when you should start noticing potential in an animal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then for bearded, it's the timeline is much quicker that you'll figure that stuff out, right? In terms of yeah. what you're gonna hold back. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's just a size <laughs> thing because bearded dragons, I mean, typically by like six weeks old, they're already at ten grams. Like they come out oh, of the wow. egg at like five or six grams, and okay. <laughs> a fully grown animal is like a lychee, where it's like you know four hundred grams. Oh my gosh, grams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the spacing, man, the spacing is uh, is killer. Especially, it feels like a lot of breeders, a lot of new breeders too, very limited on space. Like I guess most people, right? People don't yeah. allow. People don't have basements. They don't have these big facilities, and so. Maybe that's why cresteds are so popular. Like you can, like what you have back there, the full racks of yeah. like 100 babies and grouts, right? <laughs> as long as you have like the ability, because you can see there's two different sizes and then you can't yeah. see over here, but I have like a bunch of different uh, gecko junkie tanks, like 12 by 12 by 18. Oh, nice. Yeah. A couple 18 by 18 by 24s. As long as you have like the sizes to where you can continually like upgrade them as your animals grow, yeah. you're solid. Yeah. Where'd you get those racks from behind you? The, these the, are all from uh leland ward um okay, DW yeah, yeah. geckos yep. mm -hmm. i've been buying them from him for a long time um unfortunately if you know he passed like mm -hmm. a year and a half ago i think yeah. but his dad kind of yeah. carried on the business and yeah i met his dad at tinley um yeah okay. he's a really sweet guy yeah they make a great product i mean i i have no complaints i had one at one point that when we got it shipped in like a whole side was cracked and oh, no. i messaged him told him and it was like five days later i had one here <clears> so Mm, so those are just those are those are pvc racks yeah yeah, yeah these are all pvc okay. um all the shelves kind of like are subset into the actual sides and then there's a top and bottom on the unit um the ones that are up here is it stacked? Are kind exactly yeah they're just oh, stacked okay. Okay. they're not supposed to go upside down like this this is kind of makeshift on my part they have like I a little think. baseboard down here that's a little bit thicker for the the double talls yeah. But essentially, I put that little baseboard at the top, and it kind of looks like crown molding in my office almost. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's a good setup. Yeah, yeah it how... definitely maximizes on vertical space. Yeah. How big is your, your room? We talked a little bit about that earlier, but how big um, is your room for your Cresteds or your Geckos? And then how big is your room for your, your Dragons? Oof. My Dragon room, I want to say, is like 20 by 16 feet. 
it's a pretty okay. big room. It's a big room. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. My my office that I keep the majority of my geckos in right now is probably about 16 by 12. So it's a little bit smaller. Okay. Yeah. What uh, When you got into Crested's, you know, you mentioned Butler um, going down that rabbit hole watching his videos. Uh, what were some of your first morphs? I know you have some really nice stuff. You have like you have Exantix, you have Exantix Lily Whites. You have, um, you have fraps, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, cappuccino and the fraps. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You have um, everything but sables. <laughs> I know. And you want to know what? We might, we might check that box here soon. If, oh, if sweet. Fred, yeah. If Fred and Gabby <laughs> find the right, the right animal. Um, I've looked at a couple of things that you see and yeah. you're like, wow, I could do yeah. some stuff with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm still a little hesitant, obviously, just because of kind of how the cap market went, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was talking. I talk, I was talking to uh, several people about the cap. Uh, yeah, the cap issue and and how it just like tanked so quickly because it was such a crazy craze craze. <laughs> I think Korea just had so many laying around that they didn't even realize that when oh, it man. did finally pop out, it was like, oh, cool! Every breeder already has a pair, and everyone's breeding them. <laughs> And Super so funded. in one year they go yeah. from 10,000 per to like, oh, man. now you see them for 600 bucks on morph market. And it's just, it makes you cry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It was, that, it was painful, but that, you know, like we always say in some of these podcasts and talking with people, you know, the high end stuff will always uh, be still worth quite a bit. So um, as that's long what as I was you're working telling, on, uh, on high end Jan- stuff. That's what I was telling Janine at a uh, tree house. Yep. yep. I saw her high white, like tricolor caps and I, I pester her. I, hopping her dms every two <laughs> weeks and i'm like hey don't forget about me you know if you ever yeah, do yeah, release yeah. this animal i'm your yeah. guy i don't yeah you know just we got message you yeah. me. and she, she, like, well, she gets a, i, I didn't want to sell it for a thousand bucks and i'm like i'm not saying i want to buy it for a thousand bucks like <laughs> trust me i know that is some serious oh, heat oh my gosh yeah um i think a lot of people are in her dms even like the the well-known breeders and so oh i'm i'm um, sure yeah, yeah. Well, we're supposed to have her on soon, but we I put, uh, we had to postpone her a little bit. But we'll we'll eventually chat with her about all that stuff. But um, so you start? Did you? What was your first your first crested uh, morph? Were they extremes? Were they exantics? I think it was a Halloween. Um, okay. My first okay. was like What'd a you little get French morphs. Okay, cool. That was like my first. I think they yeah. were one of the first people I stumbled upon on Instagram. Um, I yeah. just really liked how clean their overall like presentation is. Their page is super professional. Yep. Um, I've sold them animals. I've spoke to them in person at the mm-hmm. Salt Lake City Expo. They're great people, um, and they make great animals. Yeah. So you get how? What is your initial collection size? And um, <clears throat> oh boy, I started off with one. I started small, and okay. then I think within six months, I was doing that like pokemon card stuff where it's like yeah. oh my gosh i need one of each yep yep i need a brindle quinn i need an extreme i need a triple yeah. x a lily white you know a yeah, lavender yeah. this that um yeah but yeah, i would say from where, where it, yeah <laughs> it, it's a rabbit hole you go down but from where it started i mean i started with one right now i probably have <clears throat> About 60, 65 adults. Um, not okay. all of them are breeding. Some of them are ones that we're still, we haven't 100% locked in like a specific plan. Or yeah. I have a couple males that I'm like, you're killer. At some point, I've got to find a female that you would yeah. just make sense with. And I don't want to let you go because I know the potential that's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then baby wise, I'm, I'm sitting at about 150, 200 babies from last season. Okay. So you just paired like maybe less than half of what you... Mm-hmm. Adults, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Last the, season, a lot of the adults that I have now weren't ready to breed last season. Okay, got it. Um, yep. About half of them were actually running, and the other ones last season were grow outs, like females that I was either waiting to hit a certain weight or males, you know, the same. Yeah. Do you feel like that was intentional in terms of the number of pairings because of your capacity of what you can handle, or is it just how it, how it was in terms of? I'm just picky with the weights. Um, okay. I've I've seen a lot of people, especially with bearded dragons, pairing females that are too young. It's mm. like su- super yeah. common. Yeah. One of like the first mm. bad transactions that I had with these was me selling one of my ten month old holdback females to someone, and the second they received her, it was like oh, instantly no. bred and instantly had eggs. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> there, there's oh, a no. certain size that you're supposed to wait for for a reason. It's it's not yeah. because you know people want to waste your time. It's because you want to have yeah. a healthy female laying yeah. healthy eggs to make healthy babies. Yeah. And what's um, so that, with, what's that weight for you in terms of, for, uh, 
for crested gecko females, I feel like it's a combination of both time and weight because I have some females. I have an exanthic female over here that is 10 months old right now, and she's almost pushing 40 grams. And there's some people that would see that and they're like, oh, that's great. You know, once they have 45 grams, let's throw them in. But you might not get any eggs or you might, their calcium sacs, if they're not developed enough, you know, make them crash. You don't want to hurt the animals. So I feel like a year and a half is kind of like the minimum for me in terms of time. And then in terms of size, I like my females to be at least 45, 50 grams. Males I'll go a little bit leaner on. Um, I've tried at like 35 grams, but I feel like they get picked on and start dropping weight really easy. So I find even with males, I'm, I'm starting to wait until kind of that 40 to 45 gram range just to make sure that they actually yeah. hold their weight. Yeah, no, that's good. I actually, so I think that's a good conversation. I'll, I'll eventually like talk about some more on the podcast, but like in terms of the weight, um, it seems like, so not, not all the, the cresteds are the same size, right? Mm-hmm. Do you find that some will grow bigger? Some will just be smaller, just like humans, right? I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I'm like, five, absolutely. Four. AJ is like, giant he's like seven eight feet i don't know (laughs) i always have to look up to him (laughs) um and uh and so cresteds aren't exactly the same and so so i've found at least from my anecdotal research of just um having about you know 60 cresteds or so um and trying to grow these things out that some will grow much quicker than others and some will just won't grow past a certain size absolutely Um, and some of my males like will grow some are like 40 some won't go past like 33 and I just try to feed them bugs, try to feed them. Bugs, and, uh, it just, they just won't go past a certain size. Do you find that's this case for you as well? Yes. There's definitely a couple animals that stay a little bit smaller than I'd like. Um, I think it kind of comes down to genetics. I don't think every crested gecko in the wild was meant to be, you know, this huge, massive 80 gram freaking yeah. potato running around with I'm, a, I'm pretty a sure the wild, a, wild one, a lot of the wild ones are smaller like we're, i'm sure they were all smaller but now that they're all captive bred we've been like pounding them with all this food and bugs which isn't a bad thing i'm not saying they're bad i'm just yeah. saying they're just bigger when they're captive bred right yeah so. i think the way we we feed them too is different obviously in the wild they don't have pangea and <laughs> yeah. repatchy and things like that sitting around yeah. they're actually having to run around and catch their food yeah. which That's i'm right. sure burns calories and keeps them a little bit leaner and a little more agile and if they're they're too big in the wild too i'm sure they're going to have trouble escaping predators them being nimble yeah. and quick is what keeps them around i'm sure yeah yeah so no i think that's a good point to to be made for for a lot of people just that a lot of these some of these like giant uh crests that we see 60 70 80 grams um there's like butter sticks uh like they look cool <laughs> i <laughs> they, do there was one i saw cool. uh, I, have one, I have i have like at least two that are like that they look cool but then you know they they're just they don't move around very quickly so you're that's a good point like they'd be eaten yeah. instantly by I, at a certain weight too if they yeah. still have their tail their tail <laughs> is just so heavy that it really increases the likelihood of them getting like fts yeah 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 yeah, I've, I've heard also AJ mentioned several times that, you know, once they hit a certain weight past uh, a number of grams, they they don't lay as well either because they're not as healthy, right? In terms of they're just too obese. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and so their production value diminishes. And so I think there's that too, right? So it's, it's tough because, and I guess this kind of goes back to the whole, you know, time versus weight thing. Yeah. But some animals, <laughs> if they hit weight at, you know, a year, year and a half, their body size might not be proper. Like if you compare yes. proportionately, yes. they might Correct. on the scale, the number might be what you want to see. But if you compare them to an animal that's like, you know, three years old, yep. that three-year-old animal could weigh the exact same and be so proportionately different. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Yeah, I, I was talking to Ralph uh, Christie Spectrum. I saw him at, at Vegas um, last week as I was picking up these racks. And we talked about that exactly. And I have like a, a female that's around 45 but proportionally, like she's not ready, you know, like mm-hmm. she's 45, 50. She's not ready. She's just kind of barreled out. She takes bugs well, but she's, you could just look at her. She's, I'm like, she, I can't yeah, you can she's see not. most of the weight is like in the gut yeah, waiting yeah, for those yeah. crickets to pass through. And then they go to the bathroom yeah. and they drop like four grams and you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then others that are around the same age, 40, uh, same weight, 45 grams. You could tell their structure is like, they're, they're bulkier. They're kind of leaned out, um, but they're more, they're long. Yeah. It's just. You can tell after a while by looking that okay, this one is a lot more ready than this one, right? And so yeah, yeah, that's. And a good I think point. 
that body composition too. I think it helps when it comes to egg laying. Cause obviously if their hips aren't wide enough and they're trying yes. to pass these massive eggs yeah. through there, I I've noticed with some females, <laughs> if you do pair them too early, you will get eggs that are like proportionately smaller. Mm. Like you'll compare yeah. them side by side with normal okay. eggs and they'll develop into normal babies and the babies will hatch and, you know, grow and be completely normal. But at first you, you hold them side by side and they almost mm. look like when you go get grapes and you've got like these really <laughs> fat grapes yeah. and then you have this periodic grape, that's like a Dinky. third of the size. Yeah. 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 yeah that's good. So yeah. Making sure that they're right age, they're uh, a good weight, but also uh, bodily proportional in terms of uh, healthy looking and ready to, ready to rock right and so absolutely yeah that's good yeah that's a good point um i don't know too much about uh dragons but uh, tell me a little bit about the bearded community the morphs are they very similar in terms of uh crested crested or they're more like snakes um and uh what is most exciting uh about the bearded so th there's a bunch of questions in there but uh tell me a little bit about the bearded community and kind of their morphs so the bearded dragon morphs are a lot more cut and dry um okay. with gecko genetics being really like polymorphic and yes yeah all of that you know there's a lot of names for crested gecko things that aren't necessarily morphs it's kind of just yep. like a, a descriptor for what it looks like flame yep. harlequin things like that like they're all kind of yep. line bred traits um with bearded dragons you have more straightforward morphs there's four main ones that are recessive you have hypo which is hypo yep. um translucent and then you have Whiplet, which is a patternless morph. They can mm. still have color, but they're completely patternless. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could actually, if you scroll down on there, you'll you'll find a Whiplet. It's a, a bright orange boy. Not this one, is it? Um, no, this it's going to be a little bit further down there. That one right there on the this left. One? Oh, left. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I no, think whatever you're looking at, I think is behind <laughs> what I'm actually seeing. Where are we looking? Go up a little bit. It's like a, a bright orange. Oh, here, here. On the left-hand side. Okay, this thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's a whiplet. It's a, basically <clears> just a... <throat> I just realized I actually forgot to mention that it's a whiplet when I posted it up. But it is a whiplet. Oh, hypo. It's, yeah. Hypo whip, whiplet. Nice. Yep, and then it's a <clears> potential <throat> carrier for uh, het trans. Um yeah, so Whiplet's just a patternless thing we're kind of working on. We're trying to get reds into it. It's really okay. hard to get color on Whiplets. People have been working at it generationally. When they first came out, they were like a tan color and really unattractive. Mm. Um, the other yeah. really big gene that everyone's into is zeros. It's not something I personally really dabble in, um, but it's a yeah. patternless and colorless gene. So all of the animals are kind of a white to a gray color. Do you have any of those? I don't. Okay. Um, I've tried to get into them and I've just one reason or another, whether <laughs> it's the female doesn't work out or the male just isn't interested in breeding, it's never really come to fruition. So after having a, a failed pair, I was like, all right, I'm just going to focus on, hmm. on what's been working for me. Yeah. Um, and then it's... we do have a, a couple incomplete dominance. Um, we've got leatherback, which you do have a super form. It's a silkback. People don't breed for it because it's deemed unethical. It's kind of okay. like scaleless ball pythons. Okay. Um, they have a lot of yeah. shedding problems and they can just get injured really easy and things like that. But yeah. Yeah. Otherwise there's not a whole lot of morphs. It's kind of just <laughs> like those five. Yeah. I mean, but scrolling through kind of your, your, um, your page, there's some pretty cool, you have some pretty cool dragons. Like I, I, again, like I don't know anything about dragons, but kind of seeing your stuff as you know, I've, I've, I've uh, known you for, <clears throat> for a few months just kind of looking at your stuff i'd like yeah you have some really nice nice dragons is the u.s uh dragon um market pretty big compared to like china or korea or any any other place overseas or what does that look like it's really tough um in terms of it's not like geckos where there's like a lot of really high-end stuff being sold and a lot of really low-end stuff being sold right and then okay. everything in the middle kind of sits there yeah. bearded dragons i think the community is a lot cheaper in terms of what they're willing to pay um okay. i don't know if that just boils down to the life expectancy because these guys in the wild really only make it to like six so in captivity mm. 10 to 12 is pretty common but in terms yeah. of breeding i don't breed any <laughs> animals that are older than five One, once a female hits five instantly He's retired yeah okay. males you can breed later but i don't really want to put that stress on them so usually i have the like same cap off for them 
but um, because their life expectancy is lower, I feel like maybe they hold a lower value. But mm. it seems like a pretty common price range for bearded dragons is kind of that like three to five hundred dollar range. For um, a, baby. a lot, yeah. A lot okay. of the adults will obviously always sell for more because these guys will pound five hundred dollars in crickets to get up to adult <laughs> yeah. size. Yeah. But that's nuts, um, <laughs> the ones that really held their value for a while were the reds, <laughs> and they're kind of reaching that like saturation point, just like caps, to where now there's a lot of people that are. In it, and this next yeah. season, you're gonna see way more reds on Morph Market than you've ever seen. <laughs> well, glad. Well, it's a good thing you 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 are Ruby Reptiles from a few years ago, and you you started a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> what it what is uh, expensive for a, a dragon like a red? A nice so red. The, these guys, when I first got them, I was one of the first people in the U.S. to actually get wow. a pair. This is a specific bloodline out of wow. China. It's called the okay. Red Monster bloodline. Essentially, it's just a line bred <laughs> trait. Um, when they first released them. There were a lot of, you know, animals they were releasing that had underbites, overbites, things like that. You had to be really selective when you were picking them. Um, Chinese people, from what I understand, they don't really look at structure like they look at color. Over there, see. they yeah. see red, and as long as it's yeah. dark red, it, it checks all the boxes for them, and it's worth a, a lot of money. Mm. And when it comes to selling to Americans, all they see are dollar signs. Yeah, what's a, what's expensive? Like five grand for that? Um, yeah, when they were first selling them, forty five hundred was like the wow. average price that they were selling okay. for. Um, yeah. When I was selling them, like two thousand to three thousand is a pretty common okay. range. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking of how they compare to the Cresteds, but um, yeah, there's a range on them, I guess. It's is... it's also different too because Cresteds also lay two eggs, so they're not quite as prolific. Whereas I can I pair see. this dude. His mom laid eight clutches when she wow. first like her season eight months in a row every month ritually she'd lay a clutch of like 30 eggs wow so i got like 200 something babies off of this <laughs> one female in one year yeah okay, okay yeah yeah that's crazy <laughs> and i think that's also partially kind of what drives the price lower because you can't really say hey this is a five thousand dollar animal and then turn around and make you know two hundred and fifty five thousand dollar animals in yep in yep. one year yeah, that Totally makes sense. Kind of like the exactic. Yeah. They're just harder to make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If this color pregnant. was a recessive thing and it was like, if I paired it up to something that wasn't red, all the babies came out like brown. Yeah. It would probably hold its value a little bit more. For but sure. the fact that you can pair this up with anything that's a nice red and all of your babies look amazing. Huh. Interesting. That's good. Um, what? So, I mean, for in the U.S. market, is it a pretty big? Bearded's are pretty big. I feel like, cause you could see them, they're at Petco, they're, they're everywhere, right? I think they kind of had their time. Um, I think crested geckos are definitely like sky's the limit in terms of okay. like where the market's going. Yeah. I think these guys were bred in captivity a lot like earlier than crested geckos. And they're also kind of in a genetic bottleneck. So yeah, there's a lot of breeders that are working on hybridizing these with um, oh. bar Barbatas. Cause there's actually, this is a central bearded dragon in okay. australia there's like seven or eight different types of like subspecies essentially mm. central is like the main one that has the best temperament that everyone breeds um they've been hybridizing them with barbatas because they naturally do that in the wild anyways and it kind of gives us a way of injecting a little bit um different genetics in there yeah. because after you know 30 years these guys the generational cycling is so quick after a year they're ready to go and then the next you know and it yeah. kind of just it's bottlenecked and Australia hasn't let us take anything for a very long time. So, yeah. So it's impossible to get pretty much. Yeah. Okay. I, I've, <laughs> I've heard of people getting animals from Australia like 10 years ago, but it was like illegal smuggling oh, stuff. Okay. You don't want to be involved in. Yeah. Yeah. People go to jail for that for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what makes bearded dragons better than geckos and what makes ge geckos better than bear, uh, bearded dragons? The fact, that I can, the fact that <laughs> I can do this with a bearded dragon. This is one thing that I absolutely love about him. When they yeah, do decide to just chill and hang out, he's his eyes are probably closed. He's just, yeah, out, he's just sleeping. Like sleeping like a baby. Yeah, he doesn't care. He's having a good time. Are they, um, are they most of them like that? Most of them are just pretty chill like that? I would say it's kind of a 50-50 gamble. Um, okay. Some of them are really cool. Other ones you try to get to sit still, and they're either too like sex driven to where they just want to head bob at everything because they'll sit there and head bob, and that's yeah. how they try and get like females' attention. And if they're too focused on that, they won't sit still. But the ones that are mm. 
I think it also kind of depends on the time of day. Um, these guys have to bask and warm up. So the second their bodies cool off, they like to get really slow and lazy. If yeah. they're all hot and warmed up, like lunchtime, they're they're not going to be very willing to sit when mm, okay. you know they're they're ready to be running around essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of geckos, though, I I love the size. I love you know how mm. they feel, how they look. There, there's a lot of different stuff, especially <laughs> when it comes to care. These guys requiring massive tanks, and they have to have UVB heat. They have to be fed multiple times a day. They have yeah. to have a very specific diet. Um, of like dark leafy greens and a variety of insects the care mm. requirements definitely a lot more work on these guys but they're definitely worth it um it, it's yeah. a it's a passion thing if you yeah, aren't passionate sure. about it it's not for yep, you it and i yep. think a lot of people get into it and they realize a year in, they're like wow that was a, a lot, lot more work. than i expected <laughs> and here you go i'm good so we see a lot of people in the bearded dragon hobby they'll enter and they become this big instagram thing for like <laughs> a year and a half and then no one ever hears from them again wow, they just disappear interesting i mean that does happen in the crested community but i don't know as how often it is with the the dragons um, i feel like crested though there's so many like smaller just hobby breeders there's not yeah, a whole lot of hobby breeders i feel like when it comes to dragons there's people who oh, own dragons yeah. and they say that they're like future breeders but they never actually end up breeding it's just collectors who enjoy having dragons i think with geckos they're so much easier to breed and less like money has to be invested to like yeah. grow them out to where yeah. you can breed them a lot easier and and that when when you do breed them you know you're committing all right i'm gonna have 10 to 12 babies if they do lay a full season of eggs whereas if you breed yeah. these it's like hey get ready because you're gonna have 200 babies yeah <laughs> and you need a lot of space <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it does seem that uh i mean just from our conversation now that the dragons are a lot you know it's a lot more of a intermediate uh thing to take care of and breathe everyone always says these are beginner reptiles i i've <laughs> never understood that this maybe is like keep. maybe to keep no maybe i don't know they they, they can definitely <laughs> handle a good amount of neglect but at the same time these guys can crash so hard mm. you can have an animal that seems like it's perfectly fine and five days later it's dead and you're like wow. i don't what did i do wrong yeah 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 that's tough yeah the the crest is, is the the ease of crested geckos for me is what kind of brought me into the the crested world too i'm like wow these are so they're so cool and they're kind of dumb but they're uh <laughs> they're, i i uh, love everything so cool. about them the little derpy, so derpy. personalities yeah, yeah all of that the <laughs> fact that they love to jump they love to climb you know all of that <laughs> stuff how they catch bugs is super amusing too yeah. these guys are super like quick with it you throw bugs in they eat them all and it's like yeah. instantly gone the geckos will like lunge and miss and <laughs> all sorts <laughs> just all different sorts of stuff, stuff that you get to They're see like kid yeah. <laughs> like two but year the, old the ease of care was definitely like the the attractive thing for him yeah. at first though because i was so used to these and if i have a room of 50 breeders of these i have like hours every day of doing stuff yeah. and you can have that many breeders if not more for geckos mm -hmm. and it's a couple hours every other day yeah do you enjoy keeping them equally or do you enjoy the the dragons more than the the crested the more that I have kind of gotten invested into the geckos, the more I love them. Um, I don't think I will ever go as hard on the dragons as I will on the geckos in the future. I feel yeah. like these guys have kind of hit a peak in terms okay. of where they can go genetically. I mean, at a certain point, the I have a few dragons that are like so red, they're actually purple and they're like wow. borderline black at all yeah. times. And I don't really know what more you can do. You know mm, what I, I mean? See. There's you've a certain... Already, you've hit the peak. <laughs> I feel like there is kind of a cap with them. And unless you start... Now I'm kind of pushing into other side projects. So I'm trying to get like... A, there's line bred animals that have stripes. And so I'm trying to okay. incorporate stripes into different colors and things like yeah. that. But in terms of color, I mean, the envelope's been pushed. And I don't think you can push it much further while still maintaining like some level of health in the animal. Yeah. Unless you want a line bred yeah. and line breed and kind of make it worse yeah do you feel like so you feel like there's no other morphs that are going to pop up or other traits that are going to pop up like cresteds i think if they were going to they probably would have it, they've mm -hmm. been around long enough long and they've time. been bred yeah. long enough unless we pull some or unless there's a random genetic mutation you know what i mean like lily white yeah. where it's just it randomly pops up and <laughs> yeah. holy cow that yeah. thing's incredible <clears throat> but i don't think it's personally going to happen there's random traits that keep kind of popping out with them but they're not 
like true genetics almost. It's like I people see. are line breeding things in their homes without saying anything and something wild pops out. And it's <laughs> like, you can breed it to other animals and kind of reproduce it, but it's not quite the yep, same. I see. No, I, I get it. Yeah. The crested world for sure is very interesting. Um, AJ has said several times that, you know, like at some point he was bored until all these like new morphs were coming up and popping up. And even uh, David at uh, Tiki's, he, he's also super excited about all these new things that are, um, that are popping up. Right. And so when I, when I chat with AJ, you know, like, you know, um, on off days or whatever, then he's just so excited about <clears throat> eggs that he's producing babies that he's producing that he's never produced before, you know, with the, all these super dolls and his empty back projects. And he, like, you could tell that he's really excited about all these like new things that he's, has there's just before. so much that yeah. hasn't been done that can be done. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of <laughs> reaching that point where now the genetics have started to get discovered and now we can start stacking and making even yeah. crazier things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what's different is with these guys, they're people have already gone through and stacked, you know, every, all six morphs that you can have into the same animal. And it's like, Ooh, ah, it's crazy, <laughs> yeah. but it's been done by so many people at this point. And unless there is a new genetic, you know, with geckos, it's like the sky's yeah. the limit at the moment. There's so There's much so variety many right different now. things. You've got yeah. sables, caps, exanthics, lily whites, yeah. all the different, yeah. you know, color varieties, pattern varieties, pinstripes, tigers, it's yep. crazy. And the variations of like mixing and matching, all these combos. And no and two are the traits. same. Yeah, man. So and there's yeah. those weird little like the snowflake gene and tangerine, yeah. which kind of gives like that pinkish tinge on the dorsal. <laughs> A lot of like, the fringe morph has uh, those those pink lines. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have one from them. They're really oh, cool. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when it when it fires up, is it pink or is it pink when it's fired down? I'm just curious. <laughs> So when it is fully, fully fired, it's kind of like, it's not true, true pink. A lot of their okay, pictures okay. that they post are like fully fired down animals, kind of yep. like uh, what you see in like Tom Favaza's like cold fusion line. Like all of those lavenders, They're they look the down. best. Exactly. They always yep. look the best fired down. Um, yep. But when you fire them up, they're also not like red. I have gotten stuff from my pink animals because I think the pink stuff is just line bread like anything else. Yeah. But um. I've paired it up with other things and I've gotten some really vibrant reds, but I've also gotten some animals that fire up such a rosy pink. It's like, it never goes red. And when it's I fired see. down, it is, it looks pastel. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You, uh, you have, so you have a lot of projects in terms of the different morphs, but I know you have, um, it's, it's really cool to see you like hatch out these uh, exanthic lily whites. Like uh, those, oh man, they're, they're beautiful. I just love contrasty animals, even if they're not exantics, even if I they're just them. like darks or um, or the, the really contrasty tricolors um, mm -hmm. and the caps and all those things seem to like, ex you know, really highlight the, uh, the contrasty colors, which is really cool to see. But uh, in terms of your exantic projects, how, how is that going? Do you have like a ton of breeders? How long have you been doing it? And how long did it take you to get to this point where you begin to um, hatch out these exanthic lily whites? Is it your first season with the axe lily whites? Um, first season producing exanthic lily whites. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. I Very produced cool. some exanthics the season up. before. Yeah. But yeah, this was our first season actually really <clears> producing <throat> some some nice exanthic lilies. Um, we started with just one exanthic. Oddly enough, we didn't even really have any breeding plans for it. Um, yeah. I just thought they were awesome. I was like, hey, it is a solid, like, black animal. Yeah. That, that's super cool to me. And I wasn't, I, I've never really been a, a fan of, like, the charcoal type stuff because with it being more of a selectively bred, line bred type of thing, you can breed it to other things and not get, you know, the exact results you're looking for. Whereas with Exanthix, you know, you know, you're going to get something on a certain spectrum there. Yeah. That looks really awesome. Yeah. Dude. But, um, yeah, we started with animal. one male. We bought a, a variety of hats. Um, we got some from uh, Catherine at MSL. We've got okay. a lot of stuff from Altitude Exotics. I'd say that's like the bulk majority. Okay. And then this last yeah. year, we also <clears throat> got a, a two head exanthics from Will and Audra at Flawless. Nice. Dang, that's awesome. Well, how many breeders total do you have exanthic wise? Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. I like 10 het females. Okay. Th three or four het males and then one visual male that's actively breeding. Um, and then I do have an exanthic lily female. 
that is breeding nice. as well. That that's where I got a lot of those exanthic lilies from last season. My okay. uh okay. my male when I got him as a baby was just like slate gray as a baby. And oh. as he's gotten older, he's kind yeah. of done that that thing that exanthic ball pythons do and he's kind of browned out and he has a few mm. patches on him that are kind of yellow. Oh, and I see. I see. and in my head, I was like, that's, that's so weird. Exanthix shouldn't be able to, you know, have yellow of any kind. Yeah. So <laughs> I figured I'm going to pair this up with another visual Exanthix just to confirm. Cause I had one customer that was, I was trying to sell him an Exanthix baby. And they're like, the dad's not even an Exanthix. He must be a head. And I'm <laughs> like, no, he's definitely an Exanthix. Like I've, I've proved him out, but just yeah. for curiosity's sake, I paired it up with a visual and lo and behold, out of eight babies, they were all, all visual Exanthix. Yeah. 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 Um, so they do kind of brown out. Some of them do, at least. There's okay. other ones that stay jet black. I think the ones that are lighter in color, and if their yeah. base color was supposed to be yellow, because like my main male, his base color is yellow, and he's a phantom. So I think okay. if he was an exanthic, he'd be kind of like a, a yellow tiger to I some see. degree. Yeah. This is your exanthic lily white? Yeah, she's beautiful. Yeah. Is this one from, uh, did you get this one from Korea? Or No, I got that one from Brian. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, Brian has some really cool stuff. It's all like secret stuff, man. Secret stash stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it, it was hard to get your hands on anything exanthic for a long time there. It was like yes. I had to I had to text him, hey, hey, het, het females, het females, het females, you know, whatever <laughs> you have, show me. And yeah. for a while too, <laughs> it was hard to get your hands on anything of quality because anything that was nice, Korea just instantly scoops up. Yeah. And uh yeah. I think now we've kind of reached that point where the market started to cool a little bit, which I'm super excited about. Not from like a sales standpoint, but from like a collector standpoint, because everyone's going to be able to get their hands on some really nice animals now instead of everything just getting thrown in a box and sent to Korea. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I think uh, that it's cool to see a lot more Exantics coming out. A lot more breeders have them and they're working with them and a lot more things are hatching out. So so before I remember, it was just even last last summer, where um, you know we're looking for Exantic, and uh, as soon as it went on to Morph Market, it got snatched up like 10k, 12k. I was like, I'm not gonna pay that much for that, but I do want one, right? And so, um, so eventually, uh, it kind of slowed down, and even now, it's there's if you go to Morph Market right now, you can see a bunch of them available, right? So now at this yeah. point, we're looking for quality in terms of. Uh, uh, the Xantics and things we can buy, which is kind of cool. So now we're working on a lot more quality things, uh, which is neat. So it'll be cool seeing what everyone's projects kind of do with them too, because <clears throat> you have to think about it too, from like altitude exotics, right? When he's doing it, I'm sure he had specific project goals. I know yeah. he's working on like super Dalmatian Xanthics and things like that, but the only Xanthics people are getting is stuff from his project and whatever yeah. his project goals yeah. were. You know what I mean? No one's, if he's not deliberately taking his Xanthics and saying, Hey, I want to pair this up with high white animals that have, you know, tigering going like completely vertical on the animal. You're not going to see any Xanthics that have like white stretching like that. Yeah. Who knows if it's even possible, you know, you're yeah. only seeing the animals that he's wanted to produce. And so now mm-hmm. that the genes kind of more widely spread, seeing cappuccino exanthics are going to be cool i think those are going to be some really yeah. really dark animals i think do the we have cappuccinos... do we have any yet in the u.s i don't think so um mm-hmm. i know korea has like cap head exanthic to cap head exanthic stuff being paired i know eggs okay. are on the ground so i'm sure they're like a year <laughs> ahead of us on anything anything yep. you can you can think of that's you know hasn't been produced yeah. yet it's coming this next year i'm sure yeah but... yeah 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 We've got um, cappuccino head exanthic eggs cooking, thankfully. Oh, so yeah, so we'll have some some cap head exanthics that pop out this year, mm. um, but it won't be probably until 2024, 2025 okay. until we actually get to see that you know fully worked back in. Yeah, market wise for exanthics, since you you're like you you make a good amount of them, um, or starting to, how has that been for you, and how's that how is that forecast uh, looking for this year? Do you think they're they're definitely going down? Um, yeah. there was a while there when I first bought my, my male visual, I paid 5,000 for him. I thought oh, it was man. an astronomical amount of money for what I was getting. <laughs> what year was that? I was like, uh, it was 2019. 2019. 
Okay. Yeah. I was like, yeah. holy cow, this, it looks amazing, but wow, you know, this is like the most expensive animal I've ever bought. And yeah. It's crazy. I found yeah. myself buying a Lily Exanthic for like 14,000 the following year <laughs> and <laughs> kind of just goes from there. But yeah, no, I mean, they, they started low. I think just like everything did in 2021 with the government handing out free money, everything kind of just peaked. And I think it's, it's on its yeah. way back down to where it should be. I think okay. once Xanthix get back down in like that four to 6,000 range, I think that's when they'll start moving really frequently. Yeah. Um, I think the U S market <laughs> is kind of lagging behind everyone still trying to sell Xanthic lilies for 20 K and visuals for <laughs> 10. And I think that market was nine months before and <laughs> it, it's gone and that ship won't come back, unfortunately, but yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, like like any breeder that uh, is in tune with the market, like you could see it. Things aren't mm -hmm. selling at twelve. You're not going to sell a Exantic for twelve. You know that, and a lot of the Korean people yeah. that were buying Exantics, I there was a certain point where you could post an Exantic up for ten, and <clears throat> I remember one night I put some up. I posted up, I think one at eight, and yeah. I'm over here thinking like, hey, you know, this is one of like the higher expensive ones on Morph Market, and I'm over here worried, you know, what whether or not it's going to sell. And I posted it like midnight. And when I woke up at 8 a.m. the next day, I had four people texting me personally. I had a couple messages in my Instagram box, a bunch of Koreans, like same thing. And it's like, hey, here, here, what's your PayPal? How can I pay you? Do you take oh, wow. you know, bank transfers? And it was like instantly gone. Wow. Okay. And okay. I think now if you post something up for eight, yeah. it, unless it's crazy, it's going to sit there for a little while. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's a fear, fear thing that we can all witness cause as we look at Morph Market, right? And so, yeah. Um, I wish Morph Market yeah. had like a, a statistics. I don't know if they do. I've never really like looked into it. They have it, it in the back end for sure. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure see. they can see it. But they I think they everything. should release like a, a weekly newsletter, almost like a, a market trend type of thing where they show you like, hey, X number yeah. of this morph sold in the last seven days and kind of give everyone like a general and maybe like average out the price that that specific yeah. morph sold for and kind of help people gauge where the market's at because it's so all over the place with certain stuff. You'll see yeah. someone selling an Exanthic that looks eh, for 10,000. And then you see someone post something up really, really nice for 10,000. Yeah. And you're like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that'd be information that would be very helpful. Um, I'm sure we've all looked for, like, for, for that. Oh, yeah. If you hit that, you know, like eBay, if you hit uh, sold and then you see whatever sold at what price, that yeah. has been like hugely helpful for how you price things and actually tracking the market. But um, if Morph, Morph Market could create that feature, I'm sure it's really easy to do. But uh, for you know, I'm, that's probably like uh, information that's like very, um, I don't know. I don't know if it's closely held information or secret information. <laughs> I'm sure they've got a reason for sitting on it. They they've got a. Yeah. A little gold mine over there that they're slowly. <laughs> the second they started incorporating memberships, I'm like, I see what's going on. Here. Oh yeah, yeah, it's yeah, okay. Yeah. I respect the hustle, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. So with the caps, though, how is that looking for you? What's your project of caps look like? Caps, fraps. <sighs> caps, man. <laughs> tell, tell, tell us your story of oh, these. Oh <laughs> boy, so. I, I remember the first the first super popped out and like everyone else I was like yeah. holy cow I was still in my oh my god I need to get every single morph phase you know so yeah yeah I was over here messaging Don every day hey hey you know show me what you've got what's for sale are you selling anything and it was no 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 and then eventually okay you know this is what I'm considering um, I ended up getting four cappuccinos from Don okay I definitely paid more than I wish I. I had paid for them, but I'm sure everyone feels my pain in that regard. You know, Doug too, um, ridiculous racks, a lot of people. Oh, but... yeah. yeah. I remember yeah. when I, I got my cap, Doug was like, dang, mine's getting delivered tomorrow. You beat me by like a day. <laughs> but Yeah, but um, the oh, animals no. that were, were coming out initially were kind of subpar. I think at first, yeah. I've noticed the head structure on my like initial caps within like six months of getting them, I had sold two of them because I realized like, these are just not animals I want to take like further into my projects. And I yeah. recouped like 90% of the money that I spent on those. Thankfully okay. it's yeah. the two that I kept that was like, I probably should have shifted out a little bit earlier, but Oh, I see. I see. Um, yeah. So they just put... produce a, a lot of spotty stuff. That's really my only complaint. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people's, I wouldn't say, I shouldn't say crazy blanket statements like this but there are a lot of caps with spots 
Um, yes. And uh, not as not as clean unless you like unless you're intentionally looking for spotted caps, which is which is totally okay, right? And the the um, people that have, I feel like all of the spotless caps are the ones who had caps in their collections originally and didn't know it. So <laughs> like Janine with like the phantoms, I know she has some spotty stuff in her lines, but she has a lot of really clean animals. Um, yes. I got one from her tuxedo line. It it doesn't have a single spot on it. Yeah. Yeah. That animal fires up jet black and it Ooh. is one of my favorites. <clears throat> I was so grateful. Did you, when I was did you get this get one that. from Tinley? Uh, no, no, oh, actually I, I had a, I did like a bloodline swap with her. She wanted okay. to have some different blood. And so I gave her a really nice, uh, I paired up my initial cap. It was like a pinstripe Dalmatian. I paired them up yeah. with an empty back. So I got a bunch okay. of like empty back caps essentially. Oh, nice. Um, and so she yeah. wanted one of those and I gave her one from that line and okay. Yeah. Kind of the swap there, but in terms of where the projects are going, I'm trying to get everything spotless. So a lot of my stuff with spots, I'm trying to work out by pairing to things okay. that have no spots. Um, yeah. I've also acquired other caps that don't have spots and I'm kind of using them for projects going forward. Um, but I'm trying to work it into Exanthix. That's like one of my main goals. I think that's going to be one yeah. of the keys to making some really dark contrasty animals. Yeah. They yeah. both kind of have the same effect on the the white that you see on like the base of the tail. Yeah, so yeah. I think when you when you combine them together, you're going to get some interesting stuff. And uh, yeah. I love the way the the patterns are on the fraps too, like how it kind of competes for dominance over the body. So I think having a, a frap Exanthic is going to look amazing just in terms yeah. of... Like yeah, him, yeah. but exanthic. Like, imagine black. Yeah, man, black. That. Yeah. Do you feel so? I mean, I know the cap. The cap gene helps uh, darken the darks, right? Yeah. Do you f have you had caps that lighten? Kind of like you, how you're saying exanthics. Some of your exanthics were lightening. It, it kind of varies. Um, I think, I would say like ninety five percent of them. To some degree, it's going to darken the animal. Um, okay. I have paired a couple caps to like lighter reds. And you definitely start seeing some funky coloration coming out of there, but they still kind of keep that rusty brownish yeah. tone to them. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, this one's super nice. I really like this one. Yeah, I'm I'm so grateful to Steve for him. Yeah. <laughs> he posted him funny. up and I jumped on that so quick. <laughs> no regrets really on that one. He's he's my superstar. I've got him paired up to a bunch of really nice stuff this season. Nice, man. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah. working on frap. Uh, uh not frap. Uh, exa uh, cap exanthics. Yeah. So my my main <laughs> projects with exanthics is just pinstripes as a whole. I think pinstripe exanthics look really oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. So I'm trying to incorporate empty back and pinstripes into exanthics. Um, wow. I'm trying okay. to kind of work in pinstripe caps along with that and kind of just blend the two projects together and kind of yeah produce the best of both worlds. Yeah, man. Super cool. Yeah, the caps and exantics. Yeah, so you're, you're pretty, you have a, do you feel like your main focus in terms of your crested projects are the exantics and the cap fraps? Uh, is there other, are there other projects that you're working on? Yeah, um, I have a few other projects. I have some <laughs> tricolor stuff that I paired up with uh, my pink drippy girl that I got from Fringe Morphs. Um, okay. I produced a couple really awesome animals out of that. Um, also drawn a blank, um, lavenders from AC reptiles. Okay. I got a, yeah. a pair from him, um, a couple years ago and grew them out. I paired them together and the babies, the consistency in terms of what I was producing, I was really shocked with, mm. um, one's just kind of like a lavender pinstripe. And then the other one is a, a lavender quad. I didn't know it, but one of them, I'm still not hundred percent, which is a soft yeah. scale. And one okay. of them is also head empty back because I produce a lot oh. of like quad stripes that are, you can tell when it's kind of a head empty back because the back starts to empty, but it's not like fully, yes. you know, completely drawn out. Yeah. And I started seeing like a lot of those consistencies <clears throat> in the babies. And then I go back and I look at the parent animals and I'm like, okay, I can kind of <laughs> see what was hiding in here. But yeah, I've got a few other, they're not like big projects, but I have a couple other smaller projects. I've got a, a pair of yellows I'm working on, um, a yeah. couple red things. Here's one of your tricolors. Pinstripe. Yeah. She was a really pretty girl. I actually, I, I kind of, when it comes to tricolors, I actually tried to cut pinstripe out of the uh, the tricolors. Oh, really? Why is yeah, that? So, Just to switch uh, things up. 
I feel like the vertical expression just looks a lot more pleasing. Um, mm. Everyone at this point, there's so many quad stripes and pinstripes out there. Incorporating yes. it, incorporating it into things like Xanthics, where there's not a lot of pinstripe Xanthics, yeah. I feel like yeah. is it's kind a of way a way to push that yeah. a little bit further. But there's just so many tricolor esque things out there that are already pinstripey. So Correct. Yeah. I got some stuff that has a lot of like extreme Harlequin triple X type of look to okay. it. And those are yeah. kind of the tricolors that I'm <laughs> trying to work with. Cause I feel like it really just changes up the pattern. I don't want to produce the same thing that everyone's producing. Yeah. 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 No, that that's good. I think uh, I have a small tiger project and I like how the tiger doesn't have the pins, you know, and just has like, mm -hmm. the, the patterning that just wraps around almost, you know, I love that. Um, yeah. Just to see the different, you know, just to switch things up a little bit, you know, I have, I have tries that are full pin that are nice, but to have the variety, I think it's very important to just keep things enjoyable, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And the way things are expressed is like super different too. Like just yeah. from one animal to the next, you'll pair up something that like, because my, my main exanthic male is a uh, tiger yellow. When yeah. I paired him up and I got those lily exanthics, <laughs> I had some that the dorsal came out completely solid. And I mm. had other ones where you can kind of see like their base color is just kind of like scratching yeah. through the dorsal and it looks really cool. Super yeah, unique. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. So what's your favorite morph that you're working with? That's tough. <laughs> just because of fraps, I think I have to go with cap. I love the monochrome okay. look of um, exanthics, but I think yeah. the potential with yeah. cap and... Lily That's a good White idea. incorporated with it is just infinite. Yeah, I saw some. I saw some crazy. I mean, Janine obviously has some really crazy, uh, crazy caps. But um, Korea had some really nice tricolor cap. You know, I, I forget who it was, but a bunch of them have it. It's like, oh man, these are so beautiful in terms of that stark contrast. Maybe even if they edited it a little bit, <laughs> you can tell that it's like a very contrasty animal. Um, absolutely oh, there, there's a few yeah. korean breeders that you you go through their page and there's not one animal you see that you're not like wow yeah, yeah, yeah. i wish i could get my hands on something like that yeah. dude yeah so i think there is more uh i don't know there's more room to play with in terms of the cat projects and trying to work on different things exantix is just a black and white <laughs> black yeah. and white animal which is beautiful yeah. too it's but, beautiful, yeah. but there is definitely going to be a, a certain point, like once all the pinstripes have been made and people start working with vertical expression and like once all of that has been reached, it's going to, there will be yeah. a cap. You know what I mean? Yeah, Unless yeah. you start gene stacking, in which case things will start getting interesting there. But <laughs> everything at a certain point, the project will hit an end goal and you kind of have to shift focus and start incorporating other things. And yeah, I'm sure, that. I'm sure uh, Brian Butler has tried everything that he probably has like secret projects that we don't know nobody knows about when you have like a thousand animals yeah. like actively breeding i know that he's oh. got some stuff in his house that would blow people's minds and he probably oh, yeah. doesn't even want to share it yeah no doubt yeah no doubt <laughs> no doubt he's definitely the uh he's the one that moves the the exantic projects along so which is cool yeah but um yeah it's really cool to see um, so in terms of uh, any other morphs, you mentioned sable, they're trying to, trying to pick up a sable if you're able to, uh, how's that looking and what is your, yeah, what is your, what are your thoughts on the sable morph in general? I think they look very <laughs> similar to caps. I think yeah. the, the resemblance is striking. I understand, you know, everything yeah. going on there, so I'm yeah, not yeah, going to yeah. get into the nitty gritty, but I think yeah. they look, they look awesome. Similar. Yeah. Um, I think they have a lot better starting point than a lot of caps. Obviously, if you start mm. with kind of a eh, animal with a bunch of spots and poor head structure, it's yeah. going to be a lot harder to improve upon that compared to getting a baby from Cuckoo's Nest uh, yeah. at Morph Menagerie. You know what I mean? Like you, you yeah, start yeah. with a baby from that and you're already like yeah. top of the leaderboard in terms of where you can go. For sure. Um, yeah, we've seen some we've seen some uh, poorly structured, poorly, uh, I don't know patterns sables for sure <laughs> that are coming out so. yeah like anything else there's breeders that are going to focus on quality and there's breeders that are going to focus on quantity yeah, um, yeah, yeah and if you're one of those people who's going out of your way to like conscientiously you know pair up your sables with stuff that you think is going to make amazing animals yeah. it's going to show in the babies if you're just trying to produce as many animals as possible so you can be you know the underground reptiles of of morph market with your sables then it'll show yeah, for sure. There's your two grand sable versus your 15 grand sable, right? <laughs> exactly. 
Um, yeah. The other thing I'd really like to get my hands on once there's more info on it is a uh, Chocho. I don't know if you've heard about that. Yeah, I've I've heard it mentioned, but what is a Chocho exactly? See that I'm not even a hundred percent. If you go to uh, on Instagram, his name is like Sunju Kill. If okay, you yes, go on his yes, page, he he's the guy who has Chochos. He claims yeah, I'm going to know what a Chocho is. <laughs> He crazy. claims it's recessive, um, but it okay. seems to kind of affect like the reds in animals. I don't mm. know what exactly it is. They have a very unique look to them, though. So it, there's definitely oh. something there. Um, but I've badgered him a few times, and he's like, nope, not releasing okay. any until 2024, 2025. At like, oh, okay, okay. He is literally doing yeah. the legwork of <laughs> pairing his stuff up to every possible morph okay. first I see. before releasing it because he wants okay. to have a complete understanding like entirely of, of what it is, which I, yeah. I respect. Yeah. Um, he's definitely yeah. chasing the knowledge <laughs> over the money. Cause I'm sure last year he could have been selling those things for, you know, 20,000 ahead to everyone. And yeah, he probably would have made a killing, but for sure. For sure. That's good. That's, I, I think that's probably the right way to do it. Like have a small group of trusted people that's working on the actual morph and its health uh, stuff and whatnot. And so yeah. I think that really just highlights like how many, genes are hiding in people's collections that people don't mm. even know though yeah because mm. he's got that and i'm sure other people probably have it somewhere and they have absolutely no idea what they're even holding on to yeah like sable you know hiding and <laughs> people don't realize until you pair it a couple times and you're like all right well this is oh, producing some so pretty cool stuff yeah some consistency here yeah yeah just like caps and empty backs are hiding in everybody's collections and nobody even knows it. <laughs> hiding in everyone's local pet store for <laughs> Phantoms, $50. phantoms are in everybody's collection, you know, nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's very cool. So, you know, talking about, uh, about the business of things. Uh, so you've been breeding crested since 2019, 2019. Okay. Buried it's were a year or two before that. Right. Yeah. And so it, when did it become, I mean, I guess it's still kind of a, a side hustle for you since you do have your own full-time uh, job um, elsewhere, but when did it become a legit business? Like as soon as you started breeding and from your mindset, were you like, okay, let me map out exactly where I'm going to be five years from now and just uh, amass and systematize everything so that you're as successful as you are. Like what did that look like from the get go? I wish I could say I had a roadmap that I paid okay. out like years one through five. These are my plans. This is what I want to do. But I think okay. life just hits you with so many different things that, yeah, you could plan it one way and it's going to happen. You know, there's 10 possible different outcomes. Um, yeah. I think I realized it was a serious business when I started getting into these. Cause okay. at first it was like, that thing's amazing. Um, I want to breed bearded dragons. I'm going to, the guy who was selling them was a Chinese dude. No one had ever heard of over yeah. here. At least he was a guy okay. who was buying animals wholesale from people um, in the States. And he just mm. randomly popped up with some crazy stuff and was like, yeah. Hey, here you go. 5,000. And this is when other bearded dragons are selling for a few hundred dollars. Wow. And, but you wouldn't ever see anything as red as what he was selling. And yeah. so yeah, yeah. I talked with the dude extensively for like a month and I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to get one from you. And yeah. I got it yeah. from him and then it died and oh no did he replace yeah. it yes he did okay, thankfully. okay. um yeah. but and it wasn't even his fault that was the worst part when oh, no. they so <laughs> i went to la i did the importing myself i was sitting there at cafe pacific waiting for it yeah. to come in and uh the plane gets in and there was another guy waiting for me to pick up one he had ordered from the same breeder and he gets his they come out with his box and there's no box for me and i'm like um hey oh, man, here, worst, here's man. my number that's you know is yeah. it back there? And they're like, no, we, we checked. It's, it's not anywhere in the warehouse. And I'm like, oh, okay. And they said that that plane, it flew from Hong Kong over to here, which is a 16 hour flight. And the plane immediately went back to Hong Kong, right? Oh, so no. <laughs> 32 hours. And when it lands there, they said, Hey, we found your box on the plane. They never pulled it off. So then they send the box right back over another 16 hours. So oh, this, no. this poor lizard was trapped in the box for like two full days and then I had to drive home from LA and when I got it, it just, it didn't thrive. It was a little small. It had wow. just, it was too long in the box, but yeah. after, you know, talking with the dude and going over everything, he was super honest and replaced it and gave me a good price on a couple more. Cause I was wanting to get additional animals after seeing yeah. like how nice <laughs> this one actually looked because the structure and everything was perfect. It's just, yeah. it didn't thrive from, I think the conditions that it was sent in, but yeah. Yeah. And that's not fault either. No. And the next yeah, batch that I got from them, no complaints. They were perfect. They okay. ate right away, all of that good stuff. And uh, 
once I started posting them up, there was just like a lot of online buzz with them. And nice, nice. Um, when I announced that I was going to be breeding them, I had people constantly because at the time I was, I think the one of the only people, there was like me and one other person that had them. And yeah. so I had a waiting list at one point of like 200 plus people. Oh and goodness. I was, wow. when I announced my waiting list, I was telling these people like, Hey, just a heads up. These babies are going to be selling anywhere from like 2000 to 3,500. And they're like, okay, yeah. add me onto the wait list. And I'm like, that's crazy, man. That's amazing. Yeah. That's very, yeah. Cool. I'm super fortunate. It was yeah. an amazing season. We sold out of pretty much every baby that we produced wow. um, from the pair. It. And yeah. it was, it was amazing. Um, and then from there, I kind of just, I took a lot of that <laughs> money and I started kind of, all right, how can I expand the business? Um, and when mm. I had stumbled upon the Cresteds, that's when I was like, all right, these are amazing. I, I want to try them out. And I, uh, I started with bioactives and kind of went from there and yeah. progressively scaled up on the morphs that I had and started getting more specific um, with what I wanted to buy. I will say, biggest piece of advice, yeah, know what you want before you get into it. Don't just go into <laughs> it and do the Pokemon card collecting. <laughs> Watch more videos than I did. Watch Yes. Pick specific morphs, <clears throat> get a specific like project goal and work yeah. towards it. It'll, it'll save you more money in the long run. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sounds like because of how the market was for your bear dragons, it went from you collecting it and immediately being able to like legitimize a solid business, which mm -hmm. helped propel you into like the crested geckos and building out your business. And so, because I've seen your stuff and, and I'm like, Oh, like you're a legit, you're a legit business in terms of you're not just like a hobby breed. You are that, but you're also like a very established bu business. And, I try um, to keep it very, very professional. There's a lot yeah. of people that you see constantly <clears throat> posting like personal stuff on their page and yeah, 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 yeah. getting in arguments and fights with other breeders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for me, yeah. it's just, <clears throat> I love the animals. I want to make badass yeah. stuff. And if I can, you know, talk to other people like you who are into the same, what I would consider kind of a, an odd hobby for the average person. You know, yeah. that's amazing. The, yeah. the community that's behind it is part of the reason why I do it. I've made more friends with reptiles than I probably, you know, have through work over the last few years. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, I agree. The reptile community is pretty cool. It's, it's really nice, like getting messages from people and, you know, messaging others and saying their stuff is cool and just chatting. It's, it's been a, it's been surprisingly like a very enjoyable time for me as a new breeder. Right. And I'm sure it is for you as well. Um, it's what? Oh, no, good. <clears throat> I was going to say, it's really nice too when you actually connect with the same like minded people because there's yeah. obviously, yeah. it's always going to be those people in the community who want to put you down and, yeah. you know, that type of stuff. But it's nice when you connect with like like minded people who, if I were to send a picture of a really, you know, cool animal that I just produced over to, yeah. Will and Audra, I know Will's going to be hyping me up. He's going to be like, hey, man, that's, that's badass. Look at that. You know, let's, let's see what you yeah, can do with it. That's fine, and man. vice versa. If he sends me something, I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And yeah. I, I like being able to have, you know, friends that you can, you know, do that stuff with and like you yeah. motivate yeah. each other and push each other in the right direction. And sometimes even trade animals and buy animals from each other. And it's really cool. Yeah. No, I think that's a huge piece in terms of even being a successful breeder. Right, making those connections, having those friends, and it helps you get through kind of the monotony of like, you know, there's so many people that have, um, <laughs> yeah, that, there's so many people who have like said that, oh, you know, like, oh, you know, they get really discouraged with their animals and then they want to exit the hobby. Right. Yeah. But if you have like this solid group of people that will keep encouraging you and, um, you know, hype you up as needed, then it'll really help you to sustain uh, what you're trying to do, trying your plans. Right. So you hit on it kind of pretty, pretty right on there. Um, you know, the market, we, as we know, is pretty volatile, uh, for you, from your experience, what are tips for everybody and how to kind of ride out the down market? Um, I don't know. Yeah. What are, what are your tips and advice in terms of trying to stay, stay afloat in the hobby? That's such a volatile market. Grow your animals out, wholesale your males, um, hmm. If you, especially if you know, like there's a lot of animals by five, 10 grams, you know, that you could grow it out to an adult and probably get more for it. But if yes. it's a male, you're going to have to sit on it for a while. So if yeah. you've got connections to wholesale, wholesale, your males, um, mm. write out the females, grow them out that I think adults sell better than 
everything else on the market, especially if they're quality adults, there will always be a market for that because breeders who get into it instantly want to, all right, I want to breed, you know, this season or next season. So they're they're looking for quality right off the top. They don't want to buy a little three grand baby and grow it out. Mm. Um, So I think in that regard, just kind of taking your time with it and don't rush it. If you're going out of your way to just breed Mm -hmm. everything you can and throw animals on morph market at three grams, I I think you're going to, at least during this time period, kind of come through a, a struggle, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's okay. What, what, yeah, what I found with the crested market is that if you're in it for, if you think you're going to make money in two years, you're not. <laughs> you, and what, need to, you need to grow but, these things out. Like I'm, I'm in my second season and uh, I'm, things are just starting to grow out. I'm just starting to pair. Um, and then I have to wait another season to kind of see how they develop. And then I know what to release, what to sell. And, um, and so it takes, it's a multi-year thing that you, I guess you have to have your mindset in terms of like, okay, if this is a legitimate business and not just a hobby, and if it's hobby, totally okay. Um, then you have to kind of be more forward thinking with the patience aspect of how you're going to do things, I guess. Right. So, yeah. My, my fiance always praises my patience. She, she always says, <laughs> I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't hatch a baby and wait two years to be able to do something with it. Oh my gosh. And yeah. I don't know. I, I love the, the process. I think above all else, yes, I love yes, being able same. to see an animal at every yeah. step of the way and you hold yes, it as absolutely. an adult. I finally reached that point where now I'm breeding animals that I've produced from yeah, animals man. that I've purchased. And yeah. it's, it's so rewarding being able to yeah. see like, wow, you are the best thing for that project that I produced, you know, in that year. And now I'm going to be making babies with you. And so yeah, I can only imagine how yeah. people like AJ feel who have been doing this for you know, 15, 20 years yeah. and they've got eight generations in on this certain line. That's just like, now it's crazy. And they know that they started with some stuff that wasn't, that's gotta be just, yeah. Shout that's out to so AJ. Rewarding. <laughs> I know, man. Yeah. It, it, um, you know, talking to newer, not newer, new ish breeders that are three, four five years in and uh, seeing their success and seeing how they're excited to, their their own productions are making these crazy things right i think yeah. man i can't wait to get there and uh it's it, again and again every day i'm reminded that you just got to be patient because these things are going to take a while to grow you know and so in the meantime just start a podcast and chat with people <laughs> exactly that's the best thing <laughs> that's why we're chatting jordan <laughs> and, and then by the time that you have you know all these babies you've made so many friends you can sell them to everybody yeah, yeah. and yeah yeah even if you don't start a podcast you know just like chat with people exactly. i think that is what's going to sustain you through the hobby. And you learn a lot from other people as you talk with uh, just a ton of different people. That is the best way to learn. Don't go to Google, go to all of (laughs) all the breeders. It's the funniest thing is I have purchased animals from breeders before that weren't even necessarily like, Oh my gosh, I need to have that. It's like, I know that you have so much knowledge on this specific topic and I'm going to support your business because yeah. I just want to tap into that because I feel like you could help me better what yeah. I'm doing as a whole. Yes. I, that is when I came into this, this hobby, that is exactly what I thought about. And so I bought a bunch of random animals from people just so I can make friends and chat with them. And so mm-hmm. they know that I'm not just here, like wasting their time. I'm going to buy some of your stuff and I'm going to make this connection and this relationship. And so this is, this is exactly how AJ and I have become good friends is because I bought a bunch of his stuff I didn't try to lowball him. I'm just straight up. Tell me what you want. And I'm going to buy it. And this is why. And again, he's not, our relationship isn't based off of money. That's what I'm saying. But what exactly what you said is that, man, you're, you're here to learn from others and Mm -hmm. you want to see what they produce, how things work, and you need to ask them questions and and learn from them. And so, um, so yeah, I feel like that is actually a really good tip that you just threw out there. I I think from a breeding standpoint too, it's, it's always, nice to see when someone's genuinely like interested in yeah. what you're doing and they they go that extra mile to like try and get information from you i don't yeah. know how to describe it it's like the bond that's kind of formed there like the mentor mentee type of thing yeah, yeah. i have yeah. a couple people like with bearded dragons that they'll shoot me a question <laughs> and they know that i will give them like the most straightforward honest answer like just yeah. to try and help them and it's it's not like hey you're gonna <laughs> give me money so like i'm gonna go out of my way to help you it's like you supported me, so I'm going to support you. Like, if you've yes. got my back, I've got yeah. your back 100%. Like, no questions asked. Yeah. And I, I think it's really cool that you can form, like, friendships over 
little four-legged animals that throw their tails at you when they get scared. And like that creates lasting, you know, relationships. It's just yeah. amazing. For sure. Have you had a lot of tire kickers too? And <laughs> people that waste your time? <laughs> I think that's part of the respect there too, is like when uh, someone's hitting you up for animals and they string you along for like three days of conversation and then you just get oh ghosted, you're like, all right, you know, that wasn't worth my time. But when you actually mm. see there's people out there that are worth like investing your time in, yeah, I've, there's a yeah. couple breeders that I've pestered and like, I know that they don't like people like that. And so yes. you go out yeah. of your way to be like the most intuitive, like I am trying to study your ways. Like if you show yeah. breeders yeah. that you care when you're trying <clears throat> to get information, they're so much more apt to like help you because right. they don't want, they don't want to just sit there and waste time for something that they deem is, you know, yep. a lost cause or a guy who's going to be just breeding animals too early for six months so that they can you know dump them on craigslist and get out like no one wants to sink time into that you know what i mean if yeah. you see people like harry are over here hosting a podcast because they want to get information out of you like obviously he cares yeah yeah for sure yeah no i, I think there in any not just the reptile hobby in anything there's always the time wasters that are just trying to make a quick buck and there are people that are actually passionate want to learn and grow and and I think the business aspect, the money aspect is very important because you want to sustain your hobby. You want to work on projects. And so I think that's uh, important to think about. But you can tell who's in it for, <laughs> for the money and who's in it for the uh, the passion projects, right? And so, um, yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, that's good. So what are some key markers of building a successful business? We talked a little bit about that already. But um, for you, uh, what is your mentality as a business owner versus a hobbyist? Like, are you more strict business vibes? Are you more laid back vibes somewhere in between? What does that look like for you? Probably somewhere in between. Um, okay. Obviously when the times are good, you're going to be a little bit more laid back when you can post an animal up on morph market and it instantly sell for 10 grand. You're going <laughs> to be expanding into projects. You didn't even really plan on getting into just yeah, because yeah. you know, why not? I, mm. I, I want to learn more about it. You know, yeah. if, if the market's slower, I think you kind of have to, be a little bit more reserved in the business aspect and maybe not splurge on animals that you don't need um, yeah. and not yeah. go for projects that you don't necessarily need to get into um, mm. just to kind of ride mm -hmm. out the storm. You know, the market is always going to have peaks and valleys. And I yeah. think kind of capitalizing on, you know, each one of those is going to be your best way to kind of succeed yeah. Like, like normal businesses, you know what I mean? When the market's going down and we're in a recession, they're cutting jobs and trying to cut their spending. And when the market's yeah, yeah. really good, they're hiring and they're being more frugal and paying people more because they, <laughs> they know that they're making more. You just yeah. kind of have, you have to have that business m mindset, but at the same time, you have to have fun with it. I feel like, because with yeah, animals, sure. if you are too business about it, you're going to just crash. Yeah. There, there's no, so much sure. poop cleaning involved. You have to love it <laughs> to a degree or it's, it's not going to work out. Yeah. Uh, how much is how much of these things are important for a successful business? Initial capital, quality product and building uh, a following. Um, and how do you funnel sales like in terms of those uh, very variables? Like, what does that look like for you? Should should people have like a good chunk of initial capital in order to get quality product? Or what is your advice there? I don't think you necessarily need to start with like an astronomical amount of money. Um, okay. I think focusing on quality for your animals is obviously always going to be the best if you yeah. spend three hundred dollars on a pair of breeding cresteds versus five grand yeah the babies are gonna are gonna show yeah, with right. your expensive pair that they are a lot better especially if you're buying them from reputable people yeah. but um yeah. i think just start with one pair if you can only afford one nice animal it's better to get one really nice male and a couple eh, females and kind of start yeah. from yeah. there um than it is to kind of do the other way around yeah um yeah. But I don't think capital is necessarily like uh, an extreme requirement when you're starting out. I think everyone kind of needs to start out from somewhere and sell mm -hmm. their babies and get the money from their babies and just reinvest it back in. And I think that's what a lot of reptile people do just from the get go to begin with. You know, the first few years are kind of reinvesting, expanding. Yeah. If you're not buying animals, you're spending money on all of this. <laughs> all the racks. And exactly. I, I've. I probably spent more money on racks over the last two years than I did on animals. Like the PVC <laughs> is where it kills you. PVC but... is crazy expensive. Yeah. I just bought, you know, I just bought my racks, right? Oh, it's crazy expensive. Yeah. It's oh, worth it though. I mean, the, they look nice I used to have all of these in tubs with lids and oh my gosh. Okay. That's what oh. I have right now. Yeah. They're all lidded. How many do you have in those tubs? Um, I have, I have some on the side too. I have maybe like 
fifty. It's not terrible. Okay. I don't. It's not a terrible amount yet. Um, well, I think once you hit the triple digits, that's where you realize this is not time effective. And <laughs> yeah, being that's... able to mist through all of the vents and have them in like a super yeah. slide it out, food in, paper towel swap, push yeah. away. You know what I mean? Much when you're better. able to go through 200 animals in under two hours, that's when stuff's dialed in. Yeah, if yeah. you're having to spend yeah. four hours going through 50, scaling <laughs> up gets really difficult. I, I realized yeah. that the hard way. Yeah, that's why, that's why I got my racks. So I can like uh, keep them lit. Keep the lids off. Quick, quick mist right down the row. Change, yeah. swap, change, slot right. So I'm, I'm starting to ramp up. Uh, I see you have the same there. mister that I have down there too. That Ryobi oh, yeah, the thing, is, Ryobi. it's a godsend. Dude, oh my gosh, amazing man. I mean, uh, <clears throat> on cer certain days I can still use my hand pump. Uh, this one right here, this mm -hmm. red one. Um, and that one works fine, but uh, this thing holds so much water and it all you need is like a quick spray and it missed the whole thing inside right absolutely so. i can literally like my racks right here they hold 30 and i can yeah. go through this entire rack and miss them all in like under 60 seconds yeah like, man the, the time saved yeah. is just invaluable with little things yeah. like that do you keep your bre uh your adult breeders in you, you had like uh gecko junkie enclosures yeah. Okay. yeah i keep them in bigger pvc ones um most of my females are housed individually i'll put the males in with them for okay like I've been kind of switching it up this season. I've yeah. been pulling the females out and pairing them separately with the males and mm -hmm. I'll get like, I'll actually see them lock and then I'll separate them. Um, yeah. I feel like that kind of helps the males keep their weight a little bit better. I see. Um, yeah. But yeah, I keep all of my breeders in those bigger, bigger enclosures. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you use paper towels in them or do you have substrate in them? I have paper towels. I've done the bioactive thing before. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough with breeding females. I love the I ease of cleaning. You know, at that point, yep. it's just cleaning the glass and it's super great. But then yep. you have to hunt for eggs and yeah, you have eggs, eggs yeah, hatching yeah. and you look in there periodically <laughs> and it's like there's a baby from an egg that you didn't find. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, or, yeah. or when you go to clean out the substrate, you'll see an egg that did hatch, but you never found that baby. And you're like, ah. Oh, no. It's yeah. probably eaten or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I kept pairs in like 18 by 18 by 24s, all bioactive okay. at first. Yeah. And uh, progressively just realized paper towel was the way to go. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been kind what of experimenting. Males? You, males too, funny enough. Okay. Um, I'd like to keep my males bioactive. I just haven't fully made that, that swap okay. since I've gotten these newer cages. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've been experimenting. You can't really see it, but a couple of yeah. these up here um, has like Coco Coar, I think it's called. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Isn't that what yeah, like, Tiki uses? And I think Sam from Crestopia has been using like Coco. Mm -hmm. I got the idea, I think, from Sam and, uh, and oh, Allie. Okay. I saw that they used it for their, yes. their gecko junkie cages. Um, for all the smaller babies that are in these, I'll always do paper towel just because you okay. can monitor their yeah. pooping, making sure they're eating their bugs and things like that a lot easier. Um, but once they get a little bit bigger, I'd say like 20 grams plus putting them in here, yeah. at least for my climate, because it's really dry here. These yeah. hold the humidity a lot better if it's not mm. paper towel. The paper towel just dries out so fast. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. So for your grow outs, you have the, the cocoa substrate. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I, once I they reach, that. Yeah. once they reach breeding age, that's when I'll put them basically back on paper towels. For males, I have some males that are always with a female. It's just, I have them rotating between whatever females mm -hmm. that I'm yep. pairing them with for the season. For sure. <clears throat> so I don't necessarily have them like in their own tank, but the yeah. males that are in their own, like permanently, they're going to be by themselves unless they're pairing those. I think doing bioactive would be the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just for keeping them clean. Cool. Yeah. And yeah. I love, I love that. Yeah, I love hearing kind of these little tips because uh, just to keep things a little bit um, more efficient and, uh, helpful right so yeah i might i might do that for the grow outs i've debated um, on moving the females over after seeing how um bertopia geckos does it um, mm. i think fireside kind of highlighted it with uh, the aquarium crate that they put on top of the substrate so that they can't dig oh. down oh, so I you have still have you still okay. have all the substrate you can see it on a uh, melanie's page bertopia okay. geckos if okay. you go and look she has like this plastic crate it has holes in it yeah. And the geckos can walk all over it. They can poop on it. The poop will fall into the soil. You know, the bugs will do their thing. Hmm. But um, it kind of allows you to have it bioactive without them being able to dig. Okay. And we're going to try so, to pull it up, see if we can share it. Yeah. I think there's uh, a lot of different, like, innovative stuff like that you can stumble upon and kind of just use it for your own benefit. Does she have it on her page here somewhere? Wow. She's been posting a lot of geckos. Um <laughs> Uh, let's see if we can Good find for it. her though. Shout out to her. She's full time now. Oh, is I she? Hope. She just went full time. I, yeah, she's awesome. I hope. Is she's she doing. does she live in uh, 
in the Arizona as well? She doesn't. Um, She's I don't down know here somewhere. Utah or Idaho. Okay, okay. I know I've seen her at like the Salt Lake Expos. I've seen her at Vegas. So I know she's somewhere in the Southwest region. I'm not yeah. exactly sure. Okay, never mind. I can't find it. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe she does or doesn't. Um, the most recent place I saw it was Fireside. He was highlighting it on a page. But um, okay, yeah, I'll check yeah. it out. Check you it could out. always go back, find it. Okay, cool. Worth looking um, into though, for sure. Just a way yeah. to get your females bioactive. Anything that saves time is good for yep. business. Yep, for sure. Yeah, in terms of like uh, social and the following, like how 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 difficult was it was it for you to kind of build this out right here, build out your IG page, your Facebook page, and amass um, a big following? Did it? Um, I think it's just consistency more than anything. <clears throat> I go through spurts where I get really busy with my main business and I don't post on social media as much. I've kind of been in that that okay. spurt for the last couple of months here over, over winter, but I go through other periods. You'll have the best growth when you're posting consistently. If you're posting yeah, yeah. anywhere from like one to three times a day, um, <clears throat> you'll get a lot more DMS with people interested in animals and mm. things like that too. So you can definitely see active social media in, um, will definitely funnel a lot more sales to your business as a whole. Okay. The second you kind yeah. of stop posting, I think Instagram starts, like kind of putting you on the back end. So then when you do post, your content's not even really shown to a lot of people. Um, they see. want you to be consistent in order to actually like rank higher in whatever algorithm thing that okay. they've got going on there. So you found a lot of success from um, Instagram and Facebook uh, kind of continually as you, when you are consistent, then people DM you and- Not so and much Facebook, but Instagram. Instagram is, okay. is- <clears throat> an invaluable resource for sales. I think Facebook is used more for community than it is for anything else. Um, okay. As far as like groups and even the people that you have interact on your page, I feel like you could be super active on a Facebook page and you're not going to get nearly as much reach as you would mm, with like a see. reel on Instagram or a video on TikTok. Even with uh, Facebook ads, huh? I don't know. I've never personally used like Facebook ads. Um, mm. I think I might have for like a month or two, but nothing really like feel like you're burning money. Yeah. You'll get follows and whatnot, but it's not going to really translate to a whole lot. I see a lot of uh, newbie breeders advertise on Instagram, which I, I think it's a great way to get your name out there and at least kind of put your page in front of other eyes that haven't seen it before. Yeah. But I don't <laughs> think it's necessarily going to translate to sales because there's yeah. like this peace of mind that you have to have as a buyer in knowing like this person's well-known, this person's reputable, they produce yeah, you know, quality sure. animals. You can't just have someone's <laughs> page pop up in front of you with 96 followers on it. And you're instantly yeah. going to be able to, Hey, that's here's the money. That's true. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, there's something to be said about that as well as a new breeder. Like how do you establish yourself in terms of like being a trustworthy source and a trustworthy bre uh, breather uh, breeder. Right. And uh, um, yeah, no, I think, this just takes time, I guess, for people to know you and to get to know you in the community, right? So that's really, I think, what it boils down to. Everything is just time, patience, time, man. See, time. You got to be three, four years in, <laughs> five years. In. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you've done a lot better than a lot of other people. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. But so I think the podcast helps put your stuff in front of so many people. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like I, that was in the, for me, it was natural because I'm like, I'm just waiting forever anyway. I might as well. And I'm already talking to people in the DMs. I might as well make a podcast and talk to you guys on, so that everybody else can kind of see these conversations. And so people know who I am, but I'm not a proven person yet. Right. I'm not a proven breeder. I'm growing all this stuff out. But um, uh, until I hit, you know, three, maybe four years, then then that's when I feel like I'll establish myself. Um, yeah. And so for now, it's just uh, people knowing who I am and which is cool. Um, but I care more about being a proven breeder, uh, which is to me important. Yeah. Right. So that reputation is definitely nice. Like yeah. I know if I go to Sam, like at Crestopia, yeah. yep. I know I'm getting a good animal. There's no questions asked. Yep. I don't have exactly. to debate second guess, anything like that. You might yep. be picky with what you're picking, but you know, regardless of what you choose, you're going to get something yeah. of quality. You, and you're I not going to get scammed. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how people fall for like the Facebook stuff where it's like oh my someone gosh. blatantly sharing photos that are obviously like not yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Like oh no, on some rehoming page with four follows and somehow. Like, oh no, oh no, yeah, okay, yeah. I'll tell a story one day, but uh, I'm too embarrassed to tell tell it now. But oh no, did you <laughs> fall for one scammed. of them? I've I've been scammed before. Uh, <laughs> so. I, I thankfully haven't oh. haven't fallen victim to anything like that. Good, 
good you're smarter than me i'm i'm very naive i'm very it's because i'm very trusting you know like yeah. i i think uh, it has its pros and cons you know it's kind of like a uh, disarming but at the same time like i'm easily taken advantage <laughs> those, those type of people are, are professional scammers too though i mean they will literally yeah. like photoshop timestamps and stuff into their photos yeah. and photoshop their hand and like try and make everything look as legit as possible and then the second they get your money it's just <laughs> oh, bye and they're probably like oh over in, in yeah, Africa yeah. or Kazakhstan or you, yeah. know, you, you don't even know where they're at. Oh, Singapore. I, I've been scammed uh, a couple of times, not not just several, once once with reptiles and another time with another business I had a decade ago or so. And it just feels so stupid, <laughs> but, but it's OK. Nothing. No, it was nothing huge. So yeah. I'll tell it's that a learning one. lesson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um. Okay, cool. Um, in terms of business strategy, and we're going to start to land the plane a little bit, but it's good talking about business with you, Jordan, because I know you're um, you're a, a very like uh, good businessman. Just looking at your stuff and looking at how you do things, very systematic, very organized, and I love that. Um, I, I love that about that. you. Um, and so I wanted to kind of pick your brain about that. Um, for you, business strategy wise, from from the get go to now, um, how uh, how has your mentality be, been in terms of are you trying to like slow roll things and kind of have uh, a slower side hustle or are you like all in? Let me like expand this Crested Gecko program like uh, tenfold in the next 10 years and try to maximize everything. What is your mentality right now and what is your strategy moving forward? I'm definitely still expanding um, just okay. in terms of how many animals I can take care of and how's at any point in time. But at the same time, I do have like a number in the back of my head that I know once I reach this number, like I'm not going to want to exceed that number of animals. Unless so I'm not you have workers, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. So I have part-time help with the bearded dragons, Okay. but the geckos I take care of solely myself. I, I know what number it is, um, probably somewhere around 800 to 1,000, I think. Okay. Yeah, that's where that, AJ is probably around there. Yeah, that would probably be my man. cap in terms yeah. of like what I can do. Um, okay. I'm not rushing there, though. I mean, when I get there, I get there. I know it'll yep. inevitably happen just between holdbacks and grow outs and things like that. But um, cool. Yeah, I mean, if I yeah. get there in a few years, cool. If I get there in a decade, you know, cool, too. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm that's here for cool the journey. Part. Yeah, but your, your goal is to expand as big as possible in terms of what you can handle. Up, uh, exactly. Up to that, yeah. that cap. I don't want to ever be one of those people that has, you know, AC reptiles where it's like 5,000 breeders and we're producing <laughs> <And yeah. laughs> 30,000 animals a year. I could never do that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think at a certain point, the quality starts to fall off unless yeah. you have, you know, full-time employees that are helping you kind of maintain yeah. those standards. But yeah, I think yeah. slow and steady wins the race in that regard. For sure. I think that's cool. And just enjoying your animals as well. Cause you, you obviously exactly. love have fun animals. with it. Yeah. That's cool. And so from, from when you started to now, has your, <clears throat> has your business grown significant, uh, significantly year after year? Has it plateaued? Where's it, has it dipped a little bit? How's it look from uh, 2019, right? Uh, with crested. I would say the, the dragons kind of peaked um, okay. just because I kind of am scaling back in terms of how many I'm producing. Um, I think the geckos this year might see a little bit of a slump. But I think overall, the the gecko thing year after year has just been getting better and better. Awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's really exciting to hear. Um, yeah, cr I think crested people, the crested community love hearing those things uh, in terms of just being encouraged by how things are continually moving and progressing, right? And even yeah. in a down, down market, I think it's a good time to uh, work out your projects and be more mindful of how you're going to grow in the next year or two or three or four, right? So, yeah, um, I try to think of the, the market a lot, like in terms of stocks is there's, yeah. there's going to be ups and downs. But if you zoom out 10 years, you know, the overall trend is just completely up. Yep. And uh, yep. with population growing and more people getting into it, I mean, there, there's yeah. no time like the present to start. If yeah. you're debating on getting into it, just get into it. You yeah. Know, pick, yeah. Pick I'm, what you love and run with it. Yeah. I mean, with this podcast and just kind of with what I'm trying to some projects I'm working on for future stuff like i i'm like determined to try to bring as many people into this hobby as possible you know just because it helps everybody it helps uh new breeders it helps um, older breeders it just helps a general hobby and the excitement to 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 get animals in front of people as much as possible you know absolutely and, um, yeah I'm, I'm determined to do that uh with this podcast and other um 
avenues uh, as I kind of work on different things, right? And so um, for you in terms of community and collabs, uh, how involved are you community-wise? And um, do you do collabs? What does that look like uh, in terms of partnering with different people? Um, when it comes to dragons, collabs really are few and far between. There's not a whole okay. lot of people that do collabs. Um, Cresteds, I'm, I'm super open to it. I haven't personally yeah. done a collab yet. I okay. tried to with one person and for one reason or another, it just didn't really work out. Yeah, Which, it seems to be know, a trend. <laughs> yeah, and I think when you're doing a collab too, if you're going to take the risk of either sending your animal to someone or vice mm. versa, I think there has to be like a certain level of like trust and mutual respect and yeah. like relationship and rapport that's already kind of been built there yeah, for yeah, it yeah, to, yeah. to happen. Um, yeah. I haven't personally done a collab yet. Definitely open to it though. I'd love mm. to in the future. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. And then lastly, um, before we get... Uh, close out with the new breeder advice, which we've already been talking about uh, extensively. Uh, what is the best and worst part of this hobby? <laughs> that's tough. Um, <laughs> if it's too hard to say, that's okay. <laughs> the the yeah. best part by far is seeing your projects through and seeing your end results actually like meet your expectations and then growing those babies out and just, wow. Mm. Um, I don't know. That's really just been a highlight recently for me. Yeah. I would say the biggest drawback are all the the community just drama and <laughs> yeah. BS that goes on with the yeah. dumbest stuff. I mean, everyone's arguing over a bunch of little critters that you know th throw their tails at you like it's a weapon. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that type of stuff mm -hmm. is just unnecessary. It's it's mm -hmm. not it's not going to better anything. You know, it's yeah. not going to yeah. make the hobby move forward. So I think mm -hmm. we should all work together in certain certain yeah. aspects. Yeah, no, that's good, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. And then, you know, lastly, on this last part, you know, if you were to give, you know, one or two uh, bits of advice for new breeders just breaking into the hobby to start their collection, and um, what would be the best thing you could tell somebody? And maybe you've already said it. And if you did, that's okay. You could just uh, reiterate it. I know it's been said by other people. But yes, no. Be it's, picky it's with your projects. Um, yeah. Don't go around and buy everything. Be specific. You know, if if you really like reds, go for reds. Um, if you really like reds, don't go for yellows. You know, it, it, do what you love specifically. <laughs> if that is your passion, you are going to succeed at it a lot more easily than if it wasn't. Um, mm. I think that it, would. And then as you grow, you, you can expand your projects. But exactly, you can always go. like. <clears throat> once you have money coming in from whatever you're selling from your main projects, that's yeah. great. You know, you can always expand into other stuff, but make sure you have like something core that that is what you're working towards. Yeah. Whether it be tricolors or this or that, you know, just make sure there's like a specific, this is what I love. This is what I'm working towards. These are some yeah. side projects I'm dabbling in, but this is like my main thing. Yeah. Cause you can also like pour more of your funds into that project to continually build that to make it even better, right? So, yeah. yep. Just when you think you have like the nicest animal in some certain yep. category, Janine yep, yep. posts her caps online. <laughs> yeah. and you realize that you're just like down 100%. Here on the totem pole. It happens all the time, man. Like different things. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I got this for this amount of money. It's the best. And then like uh, a month later, like, oh man, that's so much better. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, it, it happens, but I, I think. Yeah. I think having different stuff in your project that you can kind of work towards that ultimate goal is good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, man, really appreciate you. Where, where can people find you? I know we posted up your Instagram. Um, where else can we uh, find um, you? And, and Ruby Reptiles, you? Ruby Reptiles on pretty much everything. Facebook, Instagram. Um, I the haven't website. started YouTube, but I do have a YouTube account. So, I mean, we're there too. Um, okay. Cool. TikTok has been like the most recent thing that I've been trying to be more active on and we're slowly oh. kind of working it there i just repost all the same stuff from instagram for the most part but there's certain people yeah. that use tiktok that don't use instagram and vice versa so yeah have you found success with tiktok i, I have a tiktok account too but it's taking so much time to <laughs> to repost everything it, it's <laughs> tough because for editing videos i feel like instagram is so much more user friendly tiktok yeah. i hate editing videos on so a lot of the time i take yeah, the videos man. when you make a, a reel on instagram it saves it to your phone and i just re-upload the same thing to tiktok um but it yeah. does kind of downgrade the quality by doing that so yes yes it, it's kind of 
pick your poison, but I don't personally use TikTok. I use Instagram. So I'm a lot okay. more apt to be posting on Instagram than I am on TikTok. If someone messages me on TikTok, please don't just message me through Instagram. <laughs> I, I probably won't see your message on TikTok. That, that has happened to me too. And I, I felt so bad. I'm like, dude, just message me on Instagram. <laughs> I know. They'll be like, I messaged you three times and you never got back to me. And I'm like, I'm oh, sorry. I never even saw your first message. Yeah. I don't think, I don't remember the last time I opened my TikTok. <laughs> I'm yeah. just bad with it. You need, I feel like at that point you need to have like some sort of social media manager to manage like your Facebook and your, you know, unless you have nothing so else. To do. Different, different things, especially for people yeah. who it's like Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, like oh my Tiki's geckos. I don't know how he keeps up. Like you see his banner. He has like eight different social media symbols on it. Yeah. 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 God he, has, bless. I think he hires a social media guy uh, really? or at least a video editor that he told us. Um, I, I, that's beneficial though. That stuff is hard work if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so he just needs to like record it, and then the guy will edit everything, and so, um, so that does help. Um, yeah, cool. Um, so Ruby's rep, uh, not Ruby, sorry, RubyReptiles.com, and your uh, Instagram uh, page is also at Ruby Reptiles. Facebook the same. Uh, yep. Are you on Morph Market? I am. Uh, same okay. thing. Ruby Reptiles. Okay. Sweet man. Yeah, I'll link everything in the description, and uh, if you guys want to talk to Jordan message him say what's up um pick up some of his animals and um he's a wealth of knowledge for you guys to uh to ping and talk to so um yeah jordan appreciate you man really thankful that you're able to come on and uh join us and hang out and uh we'll swap shirts or something you know i'll take Absolutely. Yours and i'll send you one of these hey, we'll the talk after, mine. Yeah. i appreciate yeah. you having me on all right brother take awesome. care man it was great talking to you man yeah for sure later bye-bye all right